21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. I can hear you. What's the trouble there? Is she all alone? How much is on the clock? Two dollars and what? Well, why can't you pay it? Where'd she lose it? Where? You are in the muster room at 21st Precinct, Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, you're driving a hat. Drive her into the station house. We'll talk about it when you get here. Just drive around the station. We'll get it all settled here. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of the 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. What makes a city? Not buildings, not subways, not business. People make a city. From dawn to midnight, from midnight to dawn, the rich and the poor and the good and the bad pour their lives together and stir up the city. As in the 21st, a little over two weeks ago. I was working my 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. tour. At 1.55 a.m. following patrol, I returned to the station house. In the muster room, Sergeant Burns was on the boxes. Lieutenant Snyder was the desk officer. A hat driver and a well-dressed, very pretty young woman, about 20, stood in front of the railing. I walked around behind the desk to make an entry in the blotter that I had returned from patrol. What's doing, Sergeant? Nothing much, sir. It's been a quiet tour. Look, I got no time to stand here and discuss the pros and cons. There was $2.40 on the clock. Now, all I want is my money. That's all. I'd pay you if I had it. I told you I lost my wallet. Hello, Lieutenant. Captain. Lady, just give me the $2.40. She says she lost her wallet. Well, why couldn't she look and see if she had her wallet before she got in my cab at Idle Wild Airport, Lieutenant? Why does she have to wait until we get to 80th Street and Park Avenue before she finds it out? I looked in my purse for a cigarette, and I noticed the wallet was missing. Oh. I-, I told you I'd give you a cab. Lady, when I turn the cab in at 4 o'clock in the morning, the boss wants cash for what's on the clock. He don't want cash. I don't have the cash. I lost my wallet. Why do I get all the sad stories? I never seen it. Well, uh, where were you going from Idlewild, miss? She said Penn State. All right, now I'm thinking. Uh, what's your name, miss? Elizabeth Earlwood. Do you have any identification? No, it was all in my wallet, Lieutenant. I've got my checkbook, though. I'm not into it. What's your name? Swinagi, Joe Swinagi. Well, now, look, Joe. These things happen. But always to me. Why? Who are you, anyway? I'm Captain Kennelly. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'd just like to know who I'm talking to. You're wasting time here. Not news to me, Captain. I didn't want to come here. I'd suggest that you take the young lady's check and get back on the job. The only other thing to do is file a complaint against her. I got a good mind to do just that. What does that mean? I haven't arrested. 21st Precinct, Sergeant. Do you uh, know anybody around here that you can call and get the money from me? Oh, you think you're me or not? I don't know a soul, not a soul. I'm from out of town. You wouldn't want to spend the morning in court, would you, Joe? Uh, I want to spend the morning sleeping. All right, give me the check. Let me get out of here. Oh, I really appreciate it. You don't know how much I appreciate it. Uh, here, miss. You want a pen? Oh, yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. How do you want it made out? Just the cash. That's good enough. It was $2.40. I'll make it for $4. That'll be a good tip for all the trouble I caused you. That's up to you, lady. Um. Yeah? You know I lost my wallet, and I don't have a cent of cash. I couldn't make it for $10, and you give me $6 change. No, you couldn't. Now, listen, just make it for $2.40. Just give it to me and let me get out of here. All right, there wasn't any harm in asking. Plenty of harm. 21st Precinct. Thanks for enough for Burns. Yes, sir. Hold on. Captain Kennelly is a division lieutenant for you. Okay. Now, uh, lean up against the desk and write it, sir. I'll take it here. Yes, sir. Captain Kennelly. Yes, Dev. No, I can't spare him. Well, I'm short two sergeants now. Waters went sick yesterday and Klein's on vacation. Oh, I can't. No. Oh, I know there's no harm in asking. All right, Deb. That's okay. So long. How is Sergeant Waters, Captain? Did you hear from him? No, oh, he's better. His wife called last night. Oh, that's good to hear. I'm really sorry to cause so much trouble. I, I made it out for $4 anyway. Here. 
Braxton, Pennsylvania. Where's Braxton, Pennsylvania? It's near Philadelphia. And we can get I get the pen from you. That's right. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Well, can I go now? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll be seeing you. Goodbye. I can't blame him, I guess. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. But I, I couldn't help it. Singleton, do you uh, live in Braxton? Do you want yes, to talk sir, to that's him? right. Now put him on here. No, Philadelphia. What are you uh, doing in New York, Lieutenant Snyder? Well, uh, it's a long story. Uh, listen, you put unidentified on the UF-95 tag for the DOA. The aided card says he was registered into the hotel as Herbert Rowden. Now, which is right? Uh, Miss, walk across the hall there to my office, will you? Uh, over there? Yes, that's right. The card's in his pocket showed what name? And uh, just have a seat in there. Uh, yes, sir, if you want. Now, how do you spell it? Uh, E-L-R-L-E. Oh, uh, Sergeant, did you check and see if her wallet was turned in on it? I don't want to. All right, just came in a minute before you did. All right, I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. Elizabeth Earlwood. How do you spell that? E R L W O O D. What were you doing out at Idlewild? Well, you see, I came to New York on the train with a friend of mine. She left on a train for Europe at midnight. I, I was just going back to Philadelphia. All right, all right, that's okay. I'm sorry. And I, I put her in the train and took the cab to go back to Penn Station. When I opened my pocketbook for a cigarette, I noticed my wallet was missing. That's all there is to it. I couldn't help it. Did you have your pocketbook open at the airport? Oh, yes, several times. I bought a couple of magazines and we went to the bar and had a drink. Several times. You didn't miss it before you got in the cab? No, sir. I told you I was going to smoke a cigarette. You uh, and... were on your way to Penn Station to get a train to Philadelphia? Yes, sir. That's right, to Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Then I'd have to change there for Braxton. That's on the other side of Philadelphia, on the main line. I, I really couldn't help it. I... I-, I can't blame the cab driver for being mad. He's entitled to his money, but I, I couldn't help it. I didn't want to lose my wallet. Yes, I know. Do you have any friends in New York? Well, there are a couple of people. Girls I went to school with, but I wouldn't know where they are exactly. Would you like to call your home? Oh, I, I don't think that would be a good idea at this time of night. You see, I, I didn't even tell my mother and father I was coming to New York. They'd get scared to death. She's nervous anyway. And he's probably not home. He stays in town a lot. Philadelphia, that is. Grover C. Irwood, did you ever hear of him? No. Oh, he's a pretty good man. Well, if you don't call him, you have to do something. All I want to do is get to Penn Station and get on the train, that's all. I I had a return ticket, but that was in my wallet, too. How much money did you have? Oh, I I don't know. Thirty-five or forty dollars, something like that. Not much. Excuse me. Captain Kennelly. I called both the 103rd and the Port Authority police at Idlewild. There's been no wallet turned in. Okay, thanks. Well, your wallet hasn't been turned in, not as yet. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Look at me. I look terrible, don't I? Well, there's no reason for you to have been crying. Oh, I'll be all right. I just had the money to get home. That's all I need. About $10. Captain, would you pass the check for me for $10? Miss, Ten dollars, uh, that's all. I, I could get a train home and pay the cab fare from the Braxton station to my house. That's all it would take, ten dollars. Look, Miss Elwood, if I cashed a check for everyone who walked in the door... Good, I promise it's good. Oh, I don't doubt that. I, I'll leave my watch with you. Look, it, it, it's a beautiful watch. My father gave it to me. Seventeen jewels and a gold case. You keep it until you're sure about the check. All right, never mind the watch, Miss Elwood. Just write out the check. I'll cash it for you. Oh, thanks. You don't have any idea how this saved my life. It really saved my life. I took the young, young woman's check and gave her ten dollars from my own pocket. She powdered her nose, thanked me profusely, and left the station house at two twenty a.m. The rest of the tour was quiet. At eight a.m., I turned out the platoon for the day tour, signed the blotter, and left the precinct to go off duty. It was a heavy week. We were plagued by a series of housebreakings. There was a three-alarm fire, two armed robberies, a rash of car thefts, and a traffic fatality during the next few days, all in addition to the ordinary occurrences. On Friday morning at 8 a.m., I arrived in the precinct for my day tour. I turned out the platoon, then returned to my office to read the reports and communications which had accumulated. These I signed while I spoke to George Underwood, the precinct youth patrolman, 
in regard to his plans for a championship playoff among softball teams from the various playgrounds in the precinct. About 10.30, I had finished the paperwork and interviews. I walked out into the muster room. Precinct, Sergeant Brand. Oh, Ralph, uh, walk around to 346 and see the super. City Marshal's on his way to serve an eviction of it. Super says the tenant might give a little trouble. He's a fighter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, let me know. What have we got, Sergeant? Nothing much, Captain. It's pretty quiet. Hey, uh, Captain. Just a minute. Yeah, sure. Hello, man. Hi. Hello, Lieutenant. All right. Well, what's the trouble? Take a check from a girl a few days ago, a kid, 18 to 20, honey colored hair, very pretty. Yes, that's right, for $10. How did you know about it? I just had a call from downtown. They were notified by the Pennsylvania State Police. Which Ford? You're kidding. No. Your bank will notify you today, I guess. The girl's been papering the town with those checks. Put out a couple of dozen of them. How do you like that? The forgery squad got in the whole list this morning. Somebody down there recognized your name. They phoned up and asked if it was you. It's me. Who is she? Do they know? No. She's really laying down that paper all over New York. Just small amounts, but she sure picked a good name to Ford. Mrs. Elizabeth Hans Earlwood. Big name in Philadelphia. I see how she does it. I do. That kid sold me a bill of goods. She came in here with a real sad story about losing her money. Yeah. That's what she's been using, according to the forgery squad. Same story. Bank down there just threw their hands in the air when all these checks started showing up. She sold me. She really sold me. Yes, sir. Sweet, innocent, and in trouble. I, uh, you can see how she hung that paper all over town. She sold you, Captain. This next time, be careful. No, man. Next time, I'll take the watch. An alarm was put out for the young woman who forged the name of Elizabeth Hans Irwood to more than two dozen checks and passed them on various merchants and individuals in the city of New York. But the alarm didn't stop her. In the next few days, a dozen more such checks were refused payment by the bank at Braxton, Pennsylvania. In New York, the investigation was handled by detectives of the Forgery Squad, one of the several organizations of specialized investigators who operate on a citywide basis from the central office. In the meantime, the tour-by-tour activities continued in the 21st precinct. On Saturday, we had a bad homicide. On Sunday morning, a seven-year-old girl on her way to church was struck by a hit-and-run driver on First Avenue. Both her legs were broken, but she was more worried about her dress. The house burglaries continued. No leads there. Monday morning at 11.40, I returned to the precinct from patrol. In the muster room, Sergeant Burns was on the boxes. Lieutenant Snyder was on duty as desk officer. Hello, Red. Captain. Hello, Captain. What's doing, Sergeant? Nothing much, sir. It's a quiet tour. A couple of messages for you. No, thanks. That Mr. Escher wouldn't leave his first name. He said he'd call back. No, I know who he is. Oh, uh, is this one Congressman Thompson? Yes, sir, that's right. He said he'd be at that number until 2.30 p.m. Uh, do you want to sign the blotter, Captain? I've got the entry made. Yeah. All right, Red. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. Uh, watch that new pen, Captain. The ink really flowed. All right. All right. 17. Thanks, Captain. Oh, uh, Sergeant, see if you can get Congressman Thompson back for me. Yes, sir. I'll take it in my office. Where may I find Captain Kennelly? Uh, over here, ma'am. You'll have to make inquiries at the desk. That's all right, Lieutenant. I'm Captain Kennelly. Oh, how do you do? I'm Mrs. Elizabeth Hans Earlwood. Of uh, Philadelphia? Oh, you know me. Well, let's say I've heard of you. I'd like to talk to you, Captain. In here, Mrs. Earlwood. Thank you. Have a chair. Somebody's been using your name in vain, Mrs. Irwin. That's what I want to talk to you about, Captain Kennelly. Oh, how do you pronounce it? Kennelly or Kennelly? Kennelly. There's a Mrs. Conwood who serves with me on the Philadelphia Elimotionary Board. She was a Kennelly. Mrs. Byron Conwood, is she your family? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, perhaps it was Kennedy. What can I do for you, Mrs. Elwood? You know, I'm not handling the investigation. I'm just another victim in this case. Yes, and it's too bad. I know you were just performing an act of kindness. You were being a good Samaritan. I was trying to be. You were. And I want to make restitution of the $10 you lost. You're under no obligation to do that, Mrs. Irwin. I think I am. It was $10, wasn't it? 
Those checks were forged on your bank account. The responsibility belongs to the first endorser. The responsibility belongs to me, Captain. You see, I know who forged all those checks. Who? Well... Oh, excuse me. Of course. Captain Kennelly. Captain, I have Congressman Carpenter for you. Oh, all right. I'll uh, just be a minute, Mrs. Elwood. That's all right. Hello, Frank. Oh, I tried to reach you yesterday, Congressman. Yes, I know. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. What can I do for you, Frank? Well, just a little information, that's all, Congressman. Do you know Father Cortella of St. Agnes? Well, he has a student he's very interested in. The boy finished his first year at CCNY, and he's made excellent marks. He's right up there at the top of his class. Good athlete, nice young man. Uh Well, there's not much money in the family. They have a little hardware store. The boy wants to get into West Point. He'd be good. Father Cotella knows there are competitive examinations before you make your appointments. He just wants to find out how to go about getting him on the list. I told him I'd call you. You want the boy's name? No, no, not yet. We have all the information on him from Father Capella. Well, thanks for calling, Frank. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Once a good Samaritan. Oh, it's all part of the job, Miss Irwin. You, uh, you said you knew who forged those checks. Yes, I do. Who? My daughter. Oh? Don't look so surprised, Captain. I have a daughter that age. My daughter, Elizabeth. So you see, it's not really forgery. Her name is Elizabeth, too. It's not really forgery. Is uh, her middle name Hans? No. Does she have an account at that bank? No, but she has an account at the bank in Philadelphia in her own name. She has money in there, plenty of money. I deposit $50 a week to her account. I don't understand why she does it. I don't understand. Have any officers come to see you at home, Mrs. Irwin? Oh, yes. A very nice young detective from the Pennsylvania State Police. Very nice. Did you tell him you suspected it was your daughter? No. Why not? My husband told me not to. I I wanted to tell the bank to pay the checks just to let them go through, but my husband told me not to. Do you have any idea why your daughter is doing this? She's forged and passed nearly 40 checks in New York alone. I don't know. I really don't. She's had everything all her life, everything. Not a thing she wanted we didn't give her. And she just left home all of a sudden, and the next thing we knew, the checks started. I didn't even know she was in New York. Why did you leave home, Miss Elwin? I don't know. Well, there must have been a reason. It was something with her father. What? Well, it's really very personal. Miss Elwood, your personal matter isn't personal anymore. It's very public. About 40 people in New York are victims of it. I'd rather not go into it. I'm afraid you'll have to. Well, I'm involved in it, too, in a manner of speaking. Yes? Well, you see, my husband was away. He told us he was going to Chicago on business. The weekend came, and Liz was invited out to Wilmington for a party on Saturday night. She didn't want to go. She never wants to go, but I talked her into it. Anyway, she went. She had a very good time. After the party, the young hostess and her friends decided to go to an inn on the shore for coffee and a snack. She saw her father there. Oh? It was with another woman. How old is Liz? Nineteen. She'll be twenty in October. And did she talk to her father? No. Luckily, he didn't see her, but she came home very upset. I had no idea what the trouble was. Finally, on Monday or Tuesday, she spoke to me. Told me she'd seen him well. I said, Liz, I'm sorry you had to find out this way, but it's been going on for years. Your father has his friends, and I have mine. That's the way it is. And what did she say? Nothing. Nothing at all? Well, as a matter of fact, I was just on my way out of the house when I told her I was late for a dinner party. Did she leave right away? Oh, no. In a day or so. Do you have any idea where she's staying in New York? No. Oh, could she be with friends? Well, she only has one friend here. I called her even before the check started, but she hadn't heard from Liz. Captain, that girl has had the best education money could give her. She has a car all her own, a 1952 convertible, all her own. She has clothes, lots of clothes, and money of her own. What made you decide to come to New York, Miss Elwood? Well, I wanted to find her and bring her home. That's a natural thing for a mother to do. I want to get the thing straightened out. Besides, my friends would begin to ask questions. Does your husband know you came? No. He'd be against it. He's afraid she'll cause a lot of trouble. He doesn't 
want any trouble or any scandal. He's very annoyed with this. Is he? Well, I admit I don't understand her myself. What's gotten into her? Why would she do this to me? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that, Miss Elwood. I'm only a policeman. I took Mrs. Elwood upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad and introduced her to Lieutenant King. He called Detective Scanlon of the Forgery Squad who was handling the squeals in this case. Detective Scanlon, along with Lieutenant King, interviewed Mrs. Elwood. As she repeated the story she told me, I went back to my office. A new alarm was put out for the young woman and a communication to the Pennsylvania State Police advised them of the actual circumstances in the case. The next day, orders came through from the chief inspector instructing each precinct captain to accompany the patrol sergeant on cabaret inspection at the rate of no less than two a night until all cabarets were visited. Delegates to two recent conventions had complained that they were being overcharged in a few midtown nightclubs. We were instructed to look for such violations of the state liquor law and city licensing regulations as might lead to the clipping of patrons. These included the lack of a bill of fare, plainly stating prices, improper lighting, and mingling of entertainers and employees with patrons. Everything looks all right here, Captain. Yeah. Did you uh, take a look in the kitchen? Yes, sir. Are they prepared to serve food? Yes, sir. There's a cook on the job. All right. Let's go. We can go around the corner to the high-low club, Captain. We'll see. Oh, just a second. Wait here a minute. There's someone at the bar I want to talk to. Yes, sir. Well, it depends, honey. It depends on how you feel about it. Excuse me. What's on your mind? I want to talk to the young lady. What do you want to talk to me about? Listen, it's a private conversation, so I get lost. I'm a police officer. Oh, excuse me. What do you want to talk to me about? Now, lady, you remember. Listen, what's the trouble, anyway? What's your name, mister? Why do you want to know that? Because this girl is wanted for passing 39 forged checks, that's why. It's so, Carl. It's absolutely so. Listen, I only met her tonight only an hour ago. What's your name? Holtz. Carl Holtz. That's the truth. You can ask her. Isn't that the truth? It's the truth. Did you cash a check for her, Mr. Holtz? For me? No. You would have, Carl. You would have. Everybody does. Even policemen. Everybody loves me. I called Sergeant Burns over, and we took Liz Orwood and her companion to the station house. On the way in, Patrolman Novak, who had relieved Sergeant Burns on T.S., told me that Lieutenant King was in. I instructed Sergeant Burns to resume his duties and went upstairs to the 21st squad. After a few minutes of questioning, Carl Holt convinced us that he had, in fact, only met the girl that evening in another bar. He gave his address and promised to appear again if needed. Then he was allowed to go. Detective Scanlon of the forgery squad was called. While he was en route, Matt King and I talked to the girl. Is that the only reason, Liz? Well, I had to live. If you want to call your mother, you can place a call to her. No, I, I don't want to call her. I don't want to talk to her. Well, if you don't, Liz, I do. Is uh, this phone to T.S., Matt? That's right, yes. I haven't anything to say to her. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. This is Captain Kennelly. Would you step in my office and look in the corner of my desk blotter? There's a note with the number of Mrs. Elizabeth Hans Irwood in Braxton, Pennsylvania. Braxton? Yeah, that's right. Place a collect call to Mrs. Irwood at that number. Right away, Captain. All right. You have a bank account of your own, Liz. Why'd you have to forge checks in your mother's name? I don't know. It just seems like I should. What made you? I don't know. If I knew, I'd tell you. You know, you hurt a lot of people. Did I? I didn't mean to. About 40 people, including Captain Kennelly. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt anyone. You know I'm sorry, Captain. I hope you are. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. I just wanted to get money from people to prove they liked me, that's all. If they were willing to take a check from me, that proved they liked me, didn't it? That's all I wanted to prove. You could have given checks on your own account to prove the same thing. No, that's not so. It wouldn't prove the same thing. It, it wouldn't prove the same thing because... I don't know. It just wouldn't. What were you doing out at Idlewild that night? Idlewild? Yes, the airport. When? When you said you didn't have money to pay the cab driver. Oh. What were you doing there? I went out there just to cash a check, that's all. I, I thought that would be a nice place. I'm sorry I didn't realize I'd caused so much trouble. I really didn't. 
If that's my mother, I don't want to talk to her. I don't. No, right, I get it, ma'am. I won't. Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Burns, Captain. I have Mrs. Earlwood. Oh, all right. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, Captain Kennelly? Yes, this is Captain Kennelly. We have Liz here, Mrs. Earlwood. Oh, you have? How is she? She's all right. I won't talk to her. Yes, she seems all right. Not all quiver? Liz? No, I told you no. I'm sorry, Miss Elwood. She won't come to the phone. Why won't she? Well, she just refuses, Mrs. Elwood. Well, tell her I'll be there. T- tell her I love her. Tell her I'll take the next train. Her father, too. All right. Goodbye. The next train. I couldn't talk. I, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't. I, I'm not ashamed of anything, but I couldn't talk to her. She said to tell you that she loves you. She and your father are taking the next train. They won't be here. They told the captain they would? No, they won't. All they'll do is send money. They always send money. They think it's the same thing. But it isn't. It really isn't the same. Is it? No, Liz. There's a big difference. All the difference in the world. First precinct, Sergeant Burns. What do you mean you were robbed? Held up? Where this happened? Where? Did he have a gun? Well, there were two men. When was this? Just now? How long ago? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Gene Gillespie and Barbara Weeks, Wendell Holmes, Bill Zuckert, Bill Lipton, and Louis Van Ruten. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking.